Hello, Gene Schriefer, Ag Educator with the University of Wisconsin-Madison here in Southwest Wisconsin, working in the Driftless region. Talking uh, this time about uh, sward, sward density, diversity of species, and how you might think about, uh, give you some context about uh, uh, what we might want to encourage in, in doing our grazing planning on, on a variety of farms. If you've listened to some other videos that we've done in this series or that I've been part of in this series, you'll know that I, I like to use nature uh, as a model or a reference point. And when we think about nature, nature is both divergent and convergent at the same time. Uh, so what, what does that mean? We, we've got birds that fly, birds that swim, birds that walk, birds that burrow. We've got birds that eat meat, birds that eat seeds, birds that eat grass and birds that eat dead things, right? Birds that consume other birds. What does convergent mean in, in terms of nature? Well, it, it simply means that we've got different types of species performing the same task in the same ecological niche. So uh, while birds in, in, in the prior example occupy all these different niches, we also have insects, mammals, amphibians that might be in that same niche. So there's a, a function to be performed, and because of that level of diversity, that task always gets done. Nature is redundant. It has backup systems to the backup systems. And that level of diversity leads to stability across that ecosystem. So if we apply that to pastures and to grazing management, Diversity is a, a good thing. When we have multiple grasses, multiple legumes, multiple forbs occupying kind of that same niche, and we challenge that with different environmental conditions. It's a hot year, a cold year, a wet year, a dry year, and all the different combinations that we can do, something still grows, right? Nature is redundant. It has backup systems. So within one particular season, we might start out cool and wet. We might move to a hot and dry period. When we have a diverse pasture, something is going to grow under each of those different environmental conditions. When we go the opposite way from diversity to more monocultures, and uh, those, those species are going to be very specialized. If conditions are right, they do extremely well. As soon as conditions change, they do less well. And so we, we've, we've measured pasture yields over time between diverse mixtures of increasing diversity and then those, those monocultures are decreasing diversity. And what we see is, is actually similar yields in some cases, but it's how that yield is distributed over the season. When we have a single species, we will get all yield at one point of the year and less yield at other points of the year. When we have a diverse mixture, what we see is more consistent yield across the entire season. From a grazing standpoint, I'd like to know that every time we go into a paddock, we've got 1,200 pounds of dry matter available or 1,500 pounds of dry matter available. Now the species composition may change because it's spring versus July versus the fall, but that feed for our livestock is going to be present in that diverse setting. Even when we start with an existing pasture, a uh, poorly managed overgrazed pasture, short pasture, there's a lot of species diversity out there already. Those other plants that are more desirable in a grazing situation are kind of hanging on just by their fingernails. But when we change the management, when we start providing smaller areas, providing rest, allowing for residual, we'll see those other species start to express themselves. And then the species composition changes over time. Now it's not as dramatic as a cornfield, I'm sorry, it's much more subtle than that. But over a two or three year period with grazing management, we will see taller forages, we'll see clovers and legumes uh, come into the sward, maybe some forbs, and over time, density, vigor, and productivity is going to improve. 
if we've made the decision to use a broadleaf herbicide to control weeds, we incidentally take out our, our, our legumes, our red clover, white clover, trefoil, alfalfa, San Juan, whatever is growing uh, in, our, in our pasture. We, we really need to evaluate uh, whether we should be reintroducing those uh, uh, into, into those stands, whether it's frost seeding or no-till seeding, because they're a really vital component of, of our pasture stands. Again, we've had this improvement in, in, in species diversity, but the value of legumes cannot be understated in a grazing situation. When, when we've looked at pasture stands with grazing trials here in Wisconsin, we've had um, you know cool season and legume pastures and grass monocultures, but we've added nitrogen to those grass pastures so that we've got an equivalent amount of dry matter between those two uh, pastures. And we, we've repeated this study over time. And then we've added stockers and measured weight gain. And what we find is that that pasture that has a legume component, and we need to be at least 30%, preferably 40 to 50% is even better. When we have a strong legume component, we have better rates of gain that legume improves the digestibility, especially in the summer, for that grass that's becoming highly lignified. So while we can measure comparable yields, we're getting more production by having that clover component out there. That clover is capturing nitrogen out of the atmosphere because of the relationship with soil health and the mic uh, mycorrhizal fungi in the soil that's actually able to move some nitrogen from the legume nodules onto those grass roots and help feed those grasses, improve digestibility. We've got a tap-rooted plant able to access moisture with our legumes, which are going deeper in the soil profile than our grasses. Besides the additional gain, we do that at lower cost. We didn't have to pay for the herbicide. We didn't have to pay for the fertilizer. And we've got same yields and better milk, meat, and fiber off of those. Finally, when we think about that diversity, we're also feeding our soils. There's a lot of emphasis with NRCS and the ag community is really starting to embrace these concepts of, of soil health. And soil health is driven by plants and plant root exudates. We also know that different plants and different species release different root, root exudates and they're feeding a different part of that soil biotic system. So when we have diversity above ground, we have diversity in biology below ground. It's all interrelated. You know, we're not always dealing with existing pastures. And a lot of times there's land that may, may not be ideally suited uh, for, for row crop production. It might be better suited uh, for being turned into a pasture. Now, we could wait and just do nothing and it'll grow grass. Um, most likely we're going to want to seed that down. And we, we think about these principles of diversity. We'd like to have several different types of grass two or three grasses, one or two legumes, and I'd like to include a forb in that mixture if possible. Different states and different soils have different species that are, are, are better adapted. This is a great place to utilize NRCS. They, they know what's good for your region. You know, just because it works well here in Wisconsin, it may not be adapted for the entire state of Illinois or the entire state of, 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 of Indiana. You know, here we have sandy soils, clay soils, silt loam soils, uh, um, very acidic soils, and some things thrive under each of those. And so, you know, we, we need to trust the knowledge of, of the NRCX folks in, in making some of those recommendations. We don't want to do is, is plant a single monoculture. So, so think about diversity and also, depending on what the previous crop was, uh, we have had situations here where we had some herbicide carryover from the previous crop. So we need to double check some of those things, what we did last year, making sure that we're beyond that window, that uh, the next crop uh, can be a grass or can be a legume. We, we have had cases with total failures of grasses where all we had was, was, was clover germinate or, or vice versa because of herbicide carryover. While, while we're working with our partners at uh, NRCS, uh, you know, they, they will have specific recommendations for species. They'll also have some recommendations for seeding rates as far as getting that in. And they can help uh, with some of the financing of that. Now, it's, it may vary between the states what those rates are. 
uh, but it's often uh, the cost of the seed and it might also be the cost of of drilling or no-tilling or however you'd like to get that uh, field established. So there's an establishment cost share as well as the seed cost cost share. Now when we do do our seeding, uh, often we'll get different recommendations from industry versus what NRCS or your land-grant university might recommend. And you know a higher seeding rate does give us a lot more germination and we can count more plants if we have a higher seeding rate than maybe what the university might recommend. But when we look at that at the end of the season and we look at that the following spring, there's a tremendous amount of seedling mortality in those high density situations. There's only so many plants per square foot that are going to exist. And while it may look good, by the end of the season and the beginning of next season, plant densities are going to be similar and yield per acre is going to be identical. The difference is we did it at a lower cost.